So tonight I have good news and I have bad news. The good news, though, kind of trumps the bad news. Oh, I love that. So don't worry. I knew you'd like that kind of story, Nick. There is a clear winner. Um, but first, let's just read the passage from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-11. through 11. It says this, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the grace of the, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's the sermon right there. Um, I'm going to just kind of add a little bit uh, to it, hopefully that is in line with what Peter was wanting to communicate to these first century churches. First, the bad news. We'll start with the bad, right? And then we can end on a good note. The bad news is about the devil or Satan. Um, Honestly, with all of this written, this big book, there is not a ton to be said in the Bible about Satan. Um, I mean, there are other, other topics that we can read a whole lot more about, um, but we can kind of, we can piece together um, little pieces of information that we have about who he, Satan, is and kind of just get, get a picture of who he is. What do we know about Satan? What are just some of the things that you guys know? Maybe, maybe you know that the Bible says it for sure, or maybe you think, well, I just kind of heard this about Satan. What are just some of those facts, fun facts about Satan? Because <laughs> what we tend to do is um, we tend to be, we think of Satan as like a fictional, or sometimes I do, like a fictional character. I think of his caricature as a little bright red baby with diapers and horns and a pitchfork and he's sitting on somebody's shoulder you know like the the bad conscience kind of Satan that's like an emperor's new groove on Kronk is that how he looks right. I don't even know Holy yeah perfect right. description you described him exactly yes you so that a little voice too that is not quite Satan as the Bible describes him so what what do we know what are some things we know about him he opposes God Okay, he's, he's an, an enemy of God and kind of actively is opposing them. What else? He was an angel? He was and is an angel, yeah. Um, I don't know if you lose your angel status, uh, <laughs> but, but, he, but he's a fallen angel, yeah, or a, a demon, we also say, yeah, for sure. What do we know, like, uh, what are angels? Spiritual, Spiritual beings. beings. Spiritual, what else? Crazy created eternal from their creating point they, or created point they seem to not really die like like we die yeah what what else anything that they're like real like angels have Satan included has an intelligence has a will has emotions like kind of like we do um, but so even though it's spiritual, Satan is spiritual, demons, angels are, are a spiritual being, they're not natural or physical like us, they, they still are have some similarities to us and they're they're very real even though we can't see them with our own eyes. Does anybody know what kind of uh, angel Satan is thought to be? I just found this out. Okay, calls him an angel of light or, or a day star. I, he may be a cherub. If you look at um, in Ezekiel, which cherub again, I probably think of a precious moments baby or something. But but like he, he may be a cherub. So you have angels. So we know seraphim and cherubim. Um, but there's a, a passage in Ezekiel that we think is most people think is talking about Satan and, and calls him a cherub. And cherubs, if you don't know, are um, Again, there's not much written about this in Scripture. There's a few times we see cherubs and seraphim. Um, they are, uh, the cherubim are specifically angels who are um, like guarding God's holy presence. 
in one way or another. So um, the Ark of Covenant, it's cherubim, I believe, on, on with the angels extended over the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. This is where God's presence kind of is, and that's where, um, that's so it's cherubs that are guarding that. Or in Ezekiel, it also talks about cherubs. They're, they're, they're around kind of guarding the, the throne of God. The seraphim are kind of flying around, and they're worshiping God. The cherubs seem to be more guarded. The Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve are kicked out, and they can't go back in, God puts cherubs to, to guard the way from, from the garden or from the tree of life. Um, so that's those are cherubs, and it seems that maybe Satan is one of those. Um, he is uh, called a number of titles in the uh, in the scriptures. He's he's a prince of demons. Um, come on in. We're just talking about the devil. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, he is the prince of demons. He rules over all or at least many demons um, or fallen angels. Jude 6 talks about that if you, if you read Jude this last week. Um, he's also called the prince of the power of the air, which is in Ephesians 2. And so he has some sort of, kind of hard to describe, and different people go about it different ways, but he has some sort of dominion here on this earth or some kind of rule and, or, or power. It's a false kingdom that he has set up. Really, God is ultimately in control, but Satan is, 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 has deceived people into, um, into, into coming under his rule or under his power. And we've all, at one point or another, been, been caught in that place. Paul was on a mission, it says in Acts 26, to turn people from the power of Satan to the power of God. So fallen humanity is kind of living, living under this false rule of Satan on this earth. Um, so angels are, um, they had a starting point, they were created, but as far as we know, they, they haven't, there's not been any dead angels, um, as, far as, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, because of this, check this out, and this is just something we can um, just gather, that angels and demons are, are finite in their knowledge, like they're not like God, but they're finite in knowledge, but if they've been existing since God created them hundreds or thousands of years ago, they're pretty smart. Like, can you imagine, like we hopefully get smarter as we get older, uh, eventually maybe that tapers off, but can you imagine gaining knowledge and collecting data for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And they can just collect that, and so they're getting really smart. There's still things that we have on them when it comes to what we can understand as human beings, but um, nevertheless, um, at least some angels, since the, like, I'm not an angelologist, but some angels uh, like Satan who have been around at least since the garden um, have been collecting data for a long, long time. Um, they are created, um, which means they're not equal to God, which means they're not equal to Jesus. Satan is not the, like, the, the bad, as bad as Jesus is good, and they're like some equal power that they're trying to just do battle with each other. Like, Jesus, God's Son, and the Father and the Spirit have always existed. And Satan and other angels, all the angels were created, so that puts them just naturally as a created being underneath the power and rule and authority of God. Um, you could kind of look at it this way, maybe. Um, what are the other named angels in Scripture? Michael, or demons? Gabriel. Michael, Gabriel, yeah. And then there's a few demons that kind of go by names, Legion or whatever. Be yeah, Beelzebul or Beelzebub, yeah. Um, it is kind of, uh, I think, a name for Satan or a kind of a conglomeration of a name for Satan. Um, so Michael is, is called an archangel, right? And um, which seems to be some, again, I'm not an expert and the scripture doesn't have much, I think it mentioned Michael three times. Um, but it seems to be some position of... Um, 
uh, of leadership, certainly in the angel um, level. And uh, so you could you could maybe say that Satan and Michael, the archangel, are kind of a little more even as far as the the um, abilities and power and whatever that they have, or at least as as they were created to be. Okay, but it's not Jesus and Satan with equal kind of strength, but more down at the level, maybe of an archangel or, or whatever. So Michael, interestingly, if you're curious, um, was for a while, it seems, the guardian of the people of Israel, talks about in Daniel, and and it sounds like um, fairy tale, but um, Michael and Gabriel fought together, uh, Daniel 10 and 12, I think, talk about this, fought together against the king of Persia, which who knows what exactly that means at some point, um, kind of to protect Israel. Okay, this is just fascinating. Like, well, are, you love this stuff, right, Nick? Like, this is just. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe you read the book of Jude this last week, and it talks about Michael and Satan disagreeing or disputing over the body of Moses whatever the heck that means, but that's, there's some tension that the, that the two of them, Satan and Michael the Archangel, have against one another. There is also, if you want to read about it, a battle between Michael and uh, Satan in Revelation 12. Most commentators see it as kind of Satan's final attempt to attack or overthrow heaven, and Michael is involved in, in fighting that battle, that assault. Okay? That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, as much as we think of Satan as, as this awful, powerful creation, which, which we're going we're gonna to look into more tonight, um, Michael is like a, a pretty B.A. angel himself. Okay. <laughs> um, so angels and demons, we learn from Psalm uh, 8, and there's a place in the New Testament, I forget where it refers to it, are in kind of the hierarchy of creation, are in some ways above human beings, okay? So um, the psalm says that for a little while Jesus was made lower than the heavenly beings or something like that. So when Jesus became human or man, he was um, he was, he was placing himself in a lower position than the angels or heavenly beings are. So, so to some extent, the, the angels have something uh, on us. So don't picture, when you think of Satan, don't just think, oh, he's just this snake or he's just this kind of goblin-like little demon, but think of how Revelation describes him as this dragon, as this um, magnificent, otherworldly beast. Like, that's, that's who Satan is. And apart from Christ, Satan is far greater than you. And apart from Christ, demons and angels are more powerful and magnificent in, in ways than, than you are. If you put your average demon in the octagon with your average human being, uh, the human being loses every time, okay? Because angels are kind of VA like that. So, um, I mean, I, I guess, that's that's from uh, first frustration. So, um, <laughs> Satan, the name, uh, the Hebrew name means what? Anybody know? I have an idea. Accuser? Accuser is how, yeah, kind of it's used in Job. Um, executioner? Executioner, yeah, I've, I've kind of heard that. It's the maybe the the best, to the best of my knowledge, the best kind of translation of the, of the word statement is the adversary. He is, he is an opponent, he is against, uh, he is an enemy. And that it, he's an accuser, certainly that's coming against somebody. Uh, that's Satan, the Hebrew kind of word, the Satan, our Bible project that he has talked about. It. Um, the devil, who's the same person, Revelation lets us know it's the devil and Satan and that ancient serpent, and it kind of puts all of those together, saying, hey, this is the same person. Um, the, the devil, that word, what is it? Diabolos, I think, or something like that for yeah. devil. Diabolos. Was that? Yeah, Diabolos. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that kind of deceiver or slanderer? Um, Nick, you're not being. <laughs> 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 
Not getting here on time would be less. I know. I'm sorry. I just kind of brought. I should sit in the back corner. It's the devil. <laughs> Somebody at some point uh, realized, or people have realized, that our, our website and maybe some of our church stuff has pictures that are of church members that are no longer our church members. And uh, so maybe Nick's going to help us out with some uh, two megapixel images. Or two higher. and a half, maybe. Or, you know. <laughs> so devil uh, means deceiver or slanderer. It's a Greek word. But we'll use them interchangeably for the rest of the time. Devil, Satan, the enemy. Um, the devil is a liar and slander. He's the father of all lies. He was a murderer from the beginning, we read. Um, ultimately, Satan wants to destroy our trust in God. He wants to destroy our faithfulness to God and thereby lead us into disobedience away from God. Um, and he also is, I mean, you can say a number of things about him, but he is the instigator, it seems, of even pain and suffering. Like, that's the book of Job, right? Satan deciding uh, with God's permission to cause this pain and suffering on the person of Job. Um, all of this coming from this arch enemy of God. So I say all that just to say, let's get the, if, if this was you, get the kind of cartoon character uh, Satan out of your mind. And we're talking about the, the being that started the decay and the downfall of all humanity. And he is real and so we sh we frankly shouldn't talk ab about him flippantly so this the verse first verse that we're looking at here tonight first Peter 5 8 actually says be sober minded be watchful your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour be sober minded be watchful what's sober mean besides uh, not drinking alert or... alert okay yeah. Be aware. Aware. Your reactions are quick. You'd be sobered because something is like heavy or or worth considering deeply or solemnly, right? Be sober minded. Peter's saying, I want you guys to think clearly about this, about what I'm talking about. Um, I have trouble sometimes being solemn myself. I like when, when the room or conversation gets heavy, I like to make a little kind of joke or something to kind of lighten things up so it's not too uh, crazy, um, too crazy heavy, and people aren't too sober-minded um, about things. In fact, my sarcasm, that's what, like, that's what it leads to. I, it's, it just kind of interrupts that sobering kind of moment. Um, but we can be mentally intoxicated um, and not thinking clearly about the reality and the power and the horror of the devil and other um, dark things that scripture speaks about. Or we can be spiritually kind of drowsy and not aware of these things. Our reactions can be kind of delayed. And what, what we're seeing here is that a you don't want to have delayed reactions with the attack of Satan. Okay? So be sober-minded, be watchful, stay awake, don't get relaxed about this, okay? Just don't do it. Um, depending on your background, what church you grew up in, you didn't grow up in church, you might think more or less about Satan, you might think more or less about demons, like that might come to your mind more or less, maybe it's something that is only a cartoon, you don't think of as real, or maybe that's something that's been very real in your life and that you've been told of and is, is just maybe fresh in your mind. Um, but Peter is giving warning, be watchful, look out, stay alert. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, I want to point out that Peter specifically says, your <coughs> adversary, your adversary. Satan is not just the adversary of God, but he is your adversary. He is telling these churches, and by way of those churches, us, I would say. So there's a, 
like the spiritual battle going on, that if we've been a Christian for much time, we know there's something spiritual happening, but it's not just angels and demons kind of wrestling around doing their thing and we can't see it. It's out of sight, out of mind. Um, instead, Satan, it, he, he's not only the, the arch enemy of God, but Satan is against us. Satan's attack is against us. We read in a familiar verse, maybe Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now you might think to yourself, well, God can't do anything, or, or, or Satan can't do anything to me because I'm a child of God, so I'm kind of untouchable in that way. Well, why is Peter writing this to these churches, if that's the case? Be watchful, be sober-minded. Like, you better believe, church, that, the, that, that Satan is real and that he's actively seeking to destroy people, it seems, including believers. <coughs> Peter's telling the church, be alert because Satan is against you. He is your adversary. Stay alert. And um, maybe the question could come up, well, is Satan really attacking me? Like, is it really Satan? Does he care enough about me? Like, maybe it's just one of his demons. Isn't Satan living in Africa somewhere where there's a lot of demonic influence more? Isn't that kind of his home? That sort of thing. Doesn't he have bigger fish to fry, right, than, than attacking me? And I want to just kind of ponder this for just a second. Um, again, I don't, I've said this three times now, but I don't know how exactly how all the spiritual world works, and there's people that are maybe more of an expert on it, certainly more than an expert than I am. Um, but I think it's safe to say a couple of things. Satan, first of all, he is not omniscient. He's not all-knowing, right? He said that's, that's God is all-knowing. That is not Satan. So Satan, it seems, and I'm, I'm just surmising this, but Satan probably can't think of multiple things in everyone at the same time. I think God can. I mean, God is hearing prayers maybe of millions of people right now. So he's, he can actively somehow be, be cognitively aware of multiple things going on. Satan not being omniscient, I don't know. I don't think that's the case with him. He's, he, he's probably limited in that way. I'm just I'm guessing at some of this. But even if he's not omniscient, he is incredibly efficient. So he's not omniscient, but he's efficient. If you remember, I said he is really smart because he's been around for a really long time attacking people very experienced for hundreds of years. And so he's incredibly efficient in his attack. So for him to, to, to fire off an attack at somebody may not take as long as we might think. He's been perfecting this over the years. And so... And he is ruling this host of demons. So maybe he's sending somebody out here to do this and someone else out here to do this other thing. Um, but he is, he is efficient, so, so he, can, he can probably do things, though maybe not all at once in his own mind. Uh, he can certainly launch things very quickly one after another. Not only that, but um, Satan is not omnipresent. Right? He, he's not um, like God in that uh, God can kind of be everywhere or be available to all in every place at all times. That isn't the case, it seems like, with Satan. Um, even though demons, angels are spiritual beings, they, they can have some sense of location um, in, in our understanding of location, so a person is possessed by a demon, or so that means the demon is, is here, kind of in our in our location or in a particular location. Angels come and visit people, so there's actually there's a locational aspect to this spiritual world. So Satan is not omnipresent. Um, he was in the Garden of Eden at some point. He was tempting Jesus in the wilderness at some point. But I don't think that at the same point he was, I mean, maybe he had other attacks going on here with other demons, but at the same, I mean, he, he can't necessarily do multiple things at one time. However, I, again, this is just my, this, I, I should go a little quicker on this section because it's just my kind of um, musing or, or wondering about angels, but it seems to make sense to me that a demon or an angel or Satan 
in order to to move from here to there, it doesn't probably take the time like it takes us to move from here to there. For me physically, to come from North Hollywood to Seattle, I can walk there and it take a long time. I can drive there, take a train, I can take a plane. And it's, you know, I can get there maybe faster in some ways than other ways, but I have to move myself from here to there physically. Like it's a, it has to happen. I can't teleport there yet. Um, and uh, it, it's a physical thing that happens. The spiritual world, demons, angels, they're spiritual, so I, I don't, I don't know that they're unless they're kind of manifesting in a certain way that they're moving around the particles of this atmosphere like we do when we move from place to place. So regardless, like I wonder if an angel could go from Sudan to North Hollywood in an instant, right? Like they're spiritual; they maybe kind of come in and out of the earth and the heavens and. It, it's it's not like they um, it's not like they have to get a plane ticket and it's going to take Satan you know a day to get over from another place across the world over here. Okay, maybe he rides a plane. I don't know, Satan. Um, <laughs> well, takes Uber. But so so all this to say, regardless of Satan's lack of omnipresence, he probably can get around efficiently and he can attack quickly regardless of his omniscience and he is your adversary. I wouldn't be surprised if he is launching countless attacks in the time that we are here in, you know, in this teaching for an hour. Maybe more than we could even fathom that would be possible for somebody to do. So Peter's telling this first century church or these first century churches stay alert Satan himself is against you. Not just some piddly demons, which aren't really piddly, but but Satan himself, your adversary. It's also interesting that he says your adversary, the devil. Your the adversary is what Satan is the word for Satan, which is a synonym for the devil. So it's like he's saying. He's heaping phrase upon phrase to describe this guy. Your adversary, the devil, your adversary. Your adversary, your adversary is the adversary. Or your Satan is Satan himself. Your opponent is the opponent. Your enemy is the capital E enemy. Satan himself is personally against you. So stay alert. You too, Clayton. First Peter five eight. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. It's a tongue twister, by the way, if you try to say that a bunch. Satan is not just a lion. Interestingly, uh, he is he Peter uses this adjective, he's a roaring lion. Um, I think that's interesting and I think it's Peter wanting to bring a certain image to our mind of what Satan is like. And certainly he's saying it's a roaring lion to heighten our sense of, of emotion or to heighten the warning. And he's not just roaring to show his power, he is roaring because in a sense he is hungry. So Satan is on the prowl He's restlessly walking about, actively looking for prey. This is how Satan spends his time. He's not just in a meeting room somewhere just planning the battle of Armageddon and what he's going to try to do to, to win in the end. He is actively prowling around, right now even, roaring, hungry, looking for prey. He's been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. In the book of Job, which is maybe the earliest book of scripture, the earliest account that, accounts that we have. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. It's the same idea. This is what Satan does. He walks along back and forth like a roaring lion, flipping his tail around, waiting for someone to look away and to let down their guard. That's what he spends his time doing. 
And it's not just that he wants to bother people or that he wants to make people's lives hard or to scare people away with this magnificent roar, but he wants to, it says, devour you. Devour, that word means to drink down or to ingest. Like he wants to take, eat you into himself. So y'all, there is this wild beast called Satan, the most wild beast who is much more deadly than an actual lion. Elsewhere, he's likened a dragon, like we said, who has been collecting knowledge for thousands of years and is this powerful spiritual being. And he is on the prowl, roaring, hungry, looking for prey in the first century and right now. And you better stay alert because he may be preying on you. And you like getting this picture why Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Are you being watchful? Are we being watchful? Um, verse 9 tells us a little bit more about what Satan's doing. Um, it says in verse 9, resist him, resist Satan, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Now, we may never know all of the causes of suffering, um, but this verse somehow connects suffering with this lion, Satan. And I'm not sure exactly how it works, if Satan causes all suffering, or if he just kind of exploits all suffering, or what, what exactly is going on, probably both of those things. But suffering, you could say, is, is the roar of Satan. And if you succumb to that in fear, then he will devour you. But we will suffer, we will hear his roar. And that's bad, like this is all the bad news I'm talking about. Like that's I said, there's bad news and there's good news. We'll get to the good news hopefully. Yeah. Um, but there's more bad news than even that. There is a specific kind of suffering that Satan, who remember is personally against you, will use against you specifically because you're a believer. Okay? If you read the book of 1 Peter, you'll see it in, in several different ways. Peter talks about suffering, and it's, somebody, it's people, he's talking to you who suffer as Christians. You who are suffering under persecution as Christians because of what, you're, what you believe. There is a unique kind of attack, a unique kind of suffering that Satan wants to do on believers. It's one thing just to kind of suffer, and, and, and I'm sure Satan loves all kinds of suffering, but everyone suffers, but he has this unique kind that he roars at those believers in Christ. So I'm, what I'm saying is, to, to you Christians, this is a real beast prowling and roaring in a way that specifically targets you. And verse 10 tells us there's even a little bit more bad news. Satan, your adversary, will be actively, angrily causing suffering and looking to devour you for the rest of your life in this world. He's working behind the scenes for your suffering, and though you resist, he will continue to work against you. Um, if you live to be 100 years old, this verse will still be relevant to you, and it's going to be tiring, and we are to continue to be watchful. If you imagine um, Daniel in the lion's den, the, the overnight that he's in there, I'm certain that he wasn't sleeping. I would guess that his heart rate was quite elevated and just has this constant crying out to the Lord. And, and we, in a, in a similar sense, are to be like that for our entire lives. And God doesn't promise to alleviate in this world that suffering until the return of Christ. So, there's bad news and there's good news. You just heard the bad news. I don't have any more bad news tonight. Um, but here's a summary. Satan is real. And not only is he an incredible, powerful, brilliant, angry, hungry, harmful, superior, transcendent being, but he is himself personally against you as your enemy, bringing against you a tailored attack of suffering for the rest of your life. That's bad news, right? 
I think that some of you know some of that bad. Like, maybe for some of you, I don't have to like tell you these things, or we don't have to read the book that Peter has written here to to know that Satan is against you, that he is against us. Some of you have been through or are going through some types of suffering that I don't doubt are are caused by Satan himself, or certainly he's he's behind the attack against you. Some of you feel that now. Some of you think, man, I, I've, been, I've been battling this for a long time and I feel like I am about to be devoured. I'm tired. I know that the, that the Lord is on my side, but man, this is like this enemy that I have is fierce and, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to withstand this. And so maybe you're thinking, please tell me some good news. Uh, the good news starts in verse uh, 9, which starts by saying this, and look at verse 9, and just let's look for some good news in here. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings, the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So if you, if you look at verse 9, um, what's the first bit of good news that you see in verse 9? The first bit. Um, camaraderie, sort of. Like. Okay, so we see a camaraderie even before that. We'll talk about the camaraderie in a minute. It's a great word. Resist him means what? Why is this good news? Can. Yeah, we have the ability to resist him. Um, Satan can be resisted. There's hope in this life to resist Satan. We are commanded in Scripture to resist, and if if Peter is commanding that we resist, the, this apostle is writing this, then we can actually resist. James tells us, resist the devil and what? He will flee from you. It also says, submit yourselves to God before that, so they kind of go hand in hand. But he can be resisted. So that's just a little bit of, a little glimmer of hope here at the beginning. Now, he's going to keep coming back for more. Satan isn't done but um, each roar or each attack of suffering on our lives can be defended against. We can have victory in each battle. We learn just by that phrase, resist him. And we'll have victory in little battles. The war will continue. So, so the bad news is that Satan is himself personally against you. The good news is that he can be resisted. Second piece of good news is what Maddie was pointing out. Satan is not only against you, he is against us. Peter is actually giving encouragement in the camaraderie of the brotherhood of believers. Even if you look back at verse 8, when it says your adversary, that your is plural, not just Nick's adversary, but your, you, you the church, you the brotherhood, Satan is your adversary. If he was against you alone, it would feel like too much to carry. Um, maybe some of you have, have thought that before. Maybe you've thought, man, the enemy is just after me. That's depending on your terminology and what you grew up in. You, said, you say the devil, if you're from Tennessee, or you say the enemy, I think, if you're from California, and not a lot of people say Satan. Maybe the charismatic church upbringing, you say Satan. Um, but he is um, he is against you all. He is all of y'all's adversary. Um, so we can't think to ourselves, or I not think to ourselves, well, why is this happening to me? Like, why this suffering? I feel so alone. Why is there this temptation? Everyone else seems to be getting along fine. I'm alone in this attack of the evil one. And Peter reminds us in this simple verse 9 here that it's not just you. You have the family of God who is also being threatened by Satan himself who can empathize with you and together you can be resistors. Okay? We are the resistance to Satan's attack. I think Peter's saying this just to bring this camaraderie brings a firmness to our faith if you if you look at the verse. And it's cool. Peter doesn't even use the common word that like oftentimes he and Paul would say the brothers, like, hey, 
hey, um, the brothers, you know, have also experienced this, like a, a personal, like you guys are my brothers and sisters here in this church, in this local church context. He uses a different word, the brotherhood, we have translated. And so it, it's talking about, like, it's not just, well, Satan is, a, is a, an attack against this church. He is attacked against the brotherhood, it says, throughout the world, globally. He's not just against you individually. He's not just against the 20 of us, 25 of us in his church. He is against us, the, the church, the church universal. So no, we're not alone in our resistance of Satan. So the bad news, again, Satan is himself personally against you. The good news is he's actually against us. He's not just against you alone. So let that firm up your faith. Last, the best part, uh, verse 10. It says, after you have suffered a little while. It doesn't feel like a little while. <laughs> The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So, here's some good news. Satan's attacks will cease. After you've suffered a little while. We said, and it's bad news, Satan will be prowling around roaring and seeking to devour your life or devour you for the rest of your life. And a little while might at times seem unbearable, but what is Peter comparing this present suffering with? Eternal glory. Eternal glory. The, the magnitude and the duration of Satan's attacks are a very little thing when compared with the magnitude and the duration of God's reward in Christ Jesus. There's a coming day when Satan will no longer need to be resisted by those who believe. And we have to fight this battle now and, and win a battle here and there and probably occasionally lose, but the war will one day be over. So the bad news, Satan is himself personally against you, but the good news is his attacks will cease, and they will cease forever. Now, how can we be so sure that this will happen, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel? How can we be sure that the good news is going to trump the bad news? Um, first of all, I'll just remind you, like I said at the beginning, God and Satan are not equal beings. God is the creator, which makes him categorically different than all of his other creations, including Satan. So if you're if you're playing Legos and you create this Lego character that, that turns bad, you're not concerned that the Lego character is going to come up and overtake you as the creator. You're going to disassemble the Legos. You're going to smash it on the ground or whatever and because you're the creator. And so Satan and God, they're not on equal, equal playing ground, okay? First, okay, that, that tells us something that we can be sure that this, this suffering is going to stop at some point. Secondly, God is, has already shown his superiority and victory at the cross. Colossians 2 says, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. So when Jesus was killed and raised from the dead, Satan no longer then has the ability to devour those who are in Christ. Um, Hebrews 2.14 says that through death Christ destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, through Christ's death. Um, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Fear not, for I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. He says, so God has already shown his superiority. He's already shown his victory in the life of Christ and his death and resurrection. And last but not least, God promises triumph over Satan. We can read it in the book that he's written that has been truthful so far in what we've read that we can count on to continue to be true. We read about, we'll read this week, if you're reading through the scriptures with us in Revelation 20, this is an exciting part, 
The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay? So Satan can bring suffering now, but only until we are with the Lord or, and or Satan is cast into hell. So y'all, Jesus wins. Okay? It's written in the book by the Creator. And I love it to set kind of all questions at rest, like, well, where does the power lie? Who's the most powerful? Who's greater? Is it angels or humans or demons? And who rules this earth and who rules the heavens? He ends in verse 11 by saying to him, to God, the God of grace be the dominion or the power, the authority forever and ever. Amen. So Peter answers the, the dominion ultimately and eternally belongs to God. Like, we could sit back and read some descriptions of Satan and find out all about angels and demons, and we could sit back and be scared and think, man, this is a really startling description of who Satan is. But I love that within a sentence of, of the kind of rare occasion that Peter is talking about Satan, within a sentence of that, talking about the most powerful, evil exist, person in existence, he's comforting us with, but God, to, to God be dominion forever and ever, amen. Ultimately, Satan is, is Legos. He's, he's powerless. And God is in control and powerful to do whatever he wills. After you have suffered a little while, the God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He will restore you. That Greek word means to re repair or to make, uh, to perfect to complete something, however you've been torn down in this life and however whatever scars and how you've been beat up by Satan, he, he, he will perfect you, he will um, restore you, he will confirm you or support you, he will strengthen you, he will establish you so you'll be firmly rooted on a strong foundation. So as awful and as powerful as Satan is, and as unsettling as his attacks may be, the infinitely more powerful God will secure you and me and those who believe in victory. I want to point out one more thing. Remember how Peter said uh, he used this word, your adversary, uh, speaking of Satan. The adversary himself, Satan, that's what Satan means, is, is your adversary. So Satan isn't just this enemy, and he's, he's not just trying to devour the most influential people in the world who are the big fish that he needs to fry first, but he is personally himself against you and us. Not just his demons, but he himself is. And, and that puts us maybe a little closer to Satan than, than we are comfortable with. His involvement is personal. It's against us. He's this lion that's going back and forth, roaring, just, just waiting, looking for someone to devour. He can do so incredibly efficiently. But check this out. There's one little word in verse 10 that I love that makes this God of grace all the sweeter. He says, After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It's not just angels or some distant, impersonal, unfolding script that is going to happen, but God himself will do these things for you. Satan himself is your adversary. God himself is is your ally. It's draw, the, Peter draws attention to it. God will himself. There's a, 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 a what's it called? Um, he's speaking with emphasis. It's emphatic, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Satan himself is your opponent. God himself, God, creator God, is your support. Satan himself is your accuser. That's what Satan means. God himself is your advocate. Satan himself would tear you to shreds, but, but God, the creator himself, will give you victory. So what Peter's saying here is, 
be alert. Yes, be warned. Satan is personally against you. But be strengthened that God, the creator to whom belong dominion forever and ever, is himself personally for you and for us. It's not the type of thing where God's busy kind of dealing with bigger things that need to happen or more important people. But he's caring for us. If you just even look at the the kind of personal loving grace in the verses just before what we read tonight, humble yourselves. Verse 6 says, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, mighty God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he, God, cares for you. So he's mighty, all, all dominion, all rule, all power and authority forever, and he is the God of grace. And so, child of God, he cares for you, God himself. Bad news, Satan's out to get you. Good news, together we can and will resist. And one day, Paul puts it best when he ends the book of Romans, saying, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Let's pray and get a couple of final thoughts or comments as well. Father, help us not to take lightly the, uh, the evil forces in this world. Um, I guess I'm asking in a way would you help bring sober-minded to us, even myself, who can tend to just write some spiritual realities off as unimportant to me. And I pray that we would heed the warning of, of Peter to be sober-minded in our thinking, to be watchful, because there is this real enemy against us. And he is, he is just waiting to attack however he can. Help us to be mindful of that. And then, God, would you remind us of uh, the authority, really, that we have in Christ to, for now, resist. Um, eventually, Paul tells us, in some way, we even judge angels. Um, but for now, you've given us the power, you've given us the tools, because you've given us yourself to overcome the evil one and to resist the devil so that he flees from us. And Lord, would you open our eyes and help us to be reminded often that this suffering is for a little while. This temporary, false, horrible dominion of Satan is just for a short time. And Lord, we look forward to that time that, as Paul says, isn't even worth comparing to the little amount of time that we will be spending uh, as we are now. So. God, we thank you for this good news. We thank you for your victory over the evil one. Amen.